My first encounter with Tibet happened in an album I read in kindergarten. Twenty years ago, when I was a child, I used to look westward at Tibet from the highland of a city located in the lower reaches of the Yangtze River. The snows which capped the mountains in the west were then envisioned by me as white hada. I didn't know then that the Yangtze River originates from the spectacular snows. Later on, I experienced a constant yearning for traveling to Tibet, which gradually transformed to a kind of obsession. Twenty years later, I finally set foot on the land of my childhood dream. The word Tibet connotes treasures in the West in Chinese. At least that is what the snow-capped plateau means to me. When I was embraced by the warm sunlight, counting the tens and herds of cows on the roof of the world, I felt like I was roaming in a sea of clouds, or rather wandering in a fairy land. Amdov Samba was the first old man I had the honor to meet in Tibet, a self-instructed painting master from one of the monasteries who is really proud of the Tibetans. He has witnessed Tibetan history for almost one century. He looks serene and calm at the age of 87. Yet it is hard for people not to notice a heroic spirit in his appearance, a demonstration of open-mindedness and generosity. This senior artist, living in the land of breathtaking scenery, dragged me back to my long-lost memories. It has been 80 years since I started to learn painting at seven. I was most devoted to painting since childhood. I painted whatever I was interested in, without narrowing my attention to any specific theme. I was born in Amdo of Qinghai province, a place of hard living conditions where paper sheets were not available. There grew birches in my hometown whose barks served as paper sheets on which I drew paintings. Due to shortage of pigment, I painted with ashes of incense. Mm-hmm. Ramsba told me that Tibetan social life abode by strict hierarchy before 1951. During the period when Tibet was under rule of a theocracy, every aspect of people's lives, from birth to death and from household to village, was influenced and dominated by religious beliefs. At that time, to be a Lama was one of the greatest dreams of all Tibetans. Parents were more than willing to send their kids to the monasteries. Under the circumstances when there literally weren't any formal secular schools in Tibet, monasteries served as education centers. Consequently, to become a Lama was the only way to acquire knowledge and lamas were the teachers respected by all Tibetans. Like the practice of most of the Tibetan families, Amdob Zamba was sent by his father to the monastery to be a Shrama Nera, or novice at seven, and stayed there in meditation retreats. The novices were called Shrama Neras before the age of 20. 
When they turned 20, they had to be qualified by an examination to be lamas. However, what was the real force which attracted a seven-year-old kid's interest in painting? There wasn't any specific reason for that. Influence was the key to it. The monastery was surrounded by frescoes, which forged a strong impression on me. My teacher requested me to learn literature instead of painting. I declined his request and went on painting. But my heart stayed restless. Since the age of 19, I started to pay homage to Buddha. I chose Labrang Monastery or Tsatsi Tsisi as the venue to conduct such a practice, the biggest monastery in the region of Amdo, where the most complete collection of books was kept. I planned to start painting and learning sutras upon arriving at the monastery. Lamas in Tibetan monasteries at that time made their living by collecting alms. They were engaged in no other activities than reading sutras, reciting them by heart, and debating Buddhist doctrines. The intensive religious discipline and strict social hierarchy failed to restrain the youngster from his yearning for depicting natural beauty. Unsatisfied with the monotonous life in the monastery, Amdov Zamba left for Lhasa by crossing the Genkya Prairie in search for his dream after living in the monastery of his hometown for 12 years. It was in the 1930s when I enjoyed traveling around with four other Sramaneras. We toured different places while practicing religious rituals. One year later, I started to sell my paintings whenever I had the chance. My fame as a painter spread far and wide through my paintings in private possession. Because the service I offered was drawing portraits for local people, the number of people who came to me for portraits grew fast. The portraits were widely acclaimed by the public. I had so many orders for portraits that my production could hardly meet the demand. After I earned some money in this way, I embarked on the trip for Lhasa on foot together with six other monks from Dzatsisisu. There weren't any automobiles in Tibet at that time. We fed ourselves on tsamba, the Tibetan food made of ground barley grain. We begged from households along the long journey. We didn't have friends in Lhasa, but there were living quarters in the monasteries organized according to the birthplace of the dwellers. So I went to stay in Drepung Monastery. Uh Tanka, whose origin can be traced to the same period when Buddhism was first introduced to Tibet, is a rare form of artistic expression in the world. The art pieces called Paintings in Scroll by people from China's hinterland are deeply appreciated by the monasteries in Tibet and have become something indispensable in people's daily life. There have been different schools of Tanka since the very beginning, characterized by different forms of expression. In the 1930s and 1940s, the works of Amdov Zamba, though not expressive enough, were immediately accepted by the public because of the delicacy displayed in his works of lifelike portraits. While most of the Tibetans were busy fighting against the harsh natural environment and praying for Buddha's blessings, the aristocrats were craving secular portraits and traditional religious paintings. 
Andhav Samba's perfect integration of appearance with spirit in his works blew fresh air to the fine art circle in Tibet. With native intelligence and persistence, his artistic talent was displayed to its full capacity. The young man who shared the name of the Buddha of the future was well known to almost every Tibetan. When my paintings were known all over Lhasa, some people came to present me their pictures for portraits. I didn't have time to concentrate on reciting sutras. So I dedicated myself to painting by quitting the practice as a shramanera and returning to a secular life. When Amdo Samba took off his monk's gown, Tibetan history entered a new page. On May 23, 1951, Tibet achieved its peaceful liberation. In 1954, the Dalai Lama and the late 10th Panchen Erdini left for Beijing to attend the first plenary session of the first National People's Congress. People in Tibet were in a big hurry to produce different kinds of gifts to greet the upcoming Congress. Amdo Samba was assigned to one of the most arduous tasks. A Tibetan painter instead of a Han artist was requested to paint the giant portrait of Mao Zedong. I was appointed as the only qualified artist to assume the task by the Han Tibetan Joint Office located in Jokang Monastery. Ngapo Ngawang Jingmei, Zhang Jingwu, and Ping Tsuo Rafsi decided to entrust me to paint the portrait of Mao Zedong according to his picture. I got the feeling from Zamba's conversation that the event left a profound impression on him. Before Amdo Samba completed the portrait in Lhasa, he started his journey to Beijing together with the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Erdeni. There were literally no roads in Tibet 50 years ago. They traveled either by leather boat or by horse for 18 straight days before they reached Tung Mai in Tibet the starting point of the Sichuan-Tibet highway by that time, whose construction was considered to be an auspicious Hada people from China's hinterland had presented to the Tibetans. There they took buses, and in less than one day, they arrived in Chengdu, from where they continued the journey to Beijing. The significance of the experience not only lay in the sudden change of geographic location, it was the enrichment of heart and mind derived therefrom which enlightened his awareness of history and his concern for the ethnic destiny of Tibet. He started his unremitting efforts of searching for a brand new form of artistic expression of Tibetan painting. After the conclusion of the first plenary session, the Tibetan delegation toured many scenic spots according to the arrangement of the central government. Amdo Samba did not join the tour. Instead, he chose to study at the Central Academy of Fine Arts. When I was learning painting at the Academy of Fine Arts, I was told by teachers that I lacked a kind of spirit in my works, though my paintings were generally rated good. The teachers were ready to teach me. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time. I only stayed there for two months. Tourist 
Two months' time sneaked by in a wink, but Amdo Samba achieved a significant breakthrough in his painting technique. The trip also left him in an unforgettable experience. The most memorable thing in Beijing was Tianxiao Bridge. Equally unforgettable was a girl I felt so strongly about. There were a lot of street acrobatic shows in the area. I went to see the performance of the girl I was extremely fond of. She performed at the center encircled by spectators. She came to the crowd to collect money after the performance of each act. Whenever she approached me, I contributed my share. She looked at me every time she came to me. So did I. I'm telling you the truth. During my stay in Beijing last year, I paid a special visit to Tianxia Bridge. But the old scenes were all gone. Yet the girl stays even more deeply rooted in my heart. Back to Tibet, he integrated the realistic technique into traditional Tibetan painting. His initiative established his position as the pioneer of innovation in Tibetan fine arts and the most recognized master of art. When I arrived at the fantastic Norbulinka monastery, I was most impressed in particular by the delicate and lifelike effect achieved by the integration of traditional decorative techniques with three-dimensional perspective. It was daring and refreshing. The best and most giant painting which impressed me is the one in Norbulinka monastery. It is the best and my most favorite painting among the numerous pieces I did. Many foreigners commented by saying that it was really creative of me to have painted such a piece at the time when I received no professional instruction. Though Tibetans were amazed at his daring innovation, which differed from the age-old traditions, it was typical of Tibetans to embrace all the advanced and nature-oriented things in the world with open arms. His works were collected by all the major monasteries. His artistic perfection was attained in the frescoes he painted, namely the rivaling tiger and lion, the Shakyamuni, Avalokiteshvara, and the 13th and 14th Dalai Lamas. His inspiration for artistic creation reached its height right after he came back from Beijing. Amdov Samba told me that he finished about 5,000 portraits during that period.
Since the launch of the reform and opening policy in 1979, people are allowed to conduct whatever business they are interested in, including private business. Painting is the only thing I am good at, so I decided to run a school. His innovative creation was inspired by his profound love for traditional Tibetan art. His most recent artistic achievements are demonstrated both in traditional Chinese paintings and oil paintings. The mural he painted for the Sheng Tian E Hotel in Lhasa in 1997 equaled the perfect skill displayed in the classic masterpiece Fairy Maiden Descending to Earth. It is hard for people to imagine that such vivid depiction of a quiet, beautiful girl and lifelike red crown crane came from the strokes of an 83-year-old painter. The sketch on the wall of Jepung Monastery depicts the panoramic view of the monastery drawn by Amdov Sam in the summer of 2000. The makings of a great art master were fully demonstrated in the seemingly simple and careless lines he drew. I suddenly came to the realization that Amdov Sam, in fact, witnessed the earth-shaking changes taking place in Tibet by his works of art, varying from portraits of Buddha to Western-style portraits, and through his education background from learning sutras to receiving formal fine art education. Amdo Sam was proud to tell me that he runs a school in Lhasa located at the hillside leading to the Potala Palace. There are more than 30 students. No matter how busy and how tired he is, he always squeezes in some time to work in the school. He dedicates himself wholeheartedly to his students. My purpose of running the school is twofold, namely my love for painting and my concern for tanka. Tanka is a genre of art with unique features. There are many people painting tanka in Barkor Street. The works are of low artistic value, with few exceptions. The old tanka masters passed away, one after the other. Tanka would be a lost art if the sole purpose of painting them were for selling them well in the market, without paying attention to their artistic improvement. My idea of running a school is to teach students how to paint tanka. Though it wouldn't help so much in upgrading the level of its artistic creation, at least it would advance the painting of tanka into a normal track. <laughs> Though the paintings of the youngsters are far from gaining equal artistic achievements of their teacher of Zamba, what is worth to be proud of is that they represent the change of concept of the whole Tibet. The braveness in casting away the old traditions and customs is another daring probe of Amdov Zamba. I think the prohibition of women from painting tanka is sheer superstition. Only men were engaged in painting them, while women were forbidden to do so. There wasn't a set rule, it's just a tradition. Now women participate in almost all walks of life, including architecture and business. I thought many girl students would join my school, 
To my surprise, only one girl by name of Sangba showed up. So we must break away from the old tradition. When I walked out of the school, I seemed to have witnessed the artistic track followed by Amdov Zamba. The progress from being closed in to open-mindedness and from standstill to integration together with the quality of learning and continuing artistic exchange feature the sound nature of Amdov Samba and constitute the general characteristics of the Tibetan ethnic group in regard to their interpretation of the world with their life experience. I am really infatuated with Tibet. I am more than eager to experience its cycle of life repeated year by year in four seasons, and I am anxious to learn everything about Tibet. Yet, it is a great pity that I am only able to know one aspect of it. I am looking forward to returning to Tibet soon, the snow-capped plateau. <laughs> 